We are the Radmores from the Loughton Congregation. I'm Rachel. And I'm Seth. I'm Faith. I'm Lee. And this is Willow Esther Ruth. Um, she was born in the end of September and so is now a whole five months old and very keen to meet you all. Today's reading is from Luke 11 verse 37 to 54 and we're reading from the NIV version. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people did not, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also. But now, as far as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue and all other kinds of garden herbs. But you ne neglect justice and a love of God. You should have practised the latter without leaving the form former undone. Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues, synagogues. synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, and you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify, and you approve what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law! because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. So we now want to pray for Jennifer as she comes and speaks to us. Father God, we pray that you'll really bless Jennifer this morning. We thank you for the preparation and the time she's taken to hear your word for us this morning. We pray that you'll give us uh, open hearts to hear what's being said to us directly, God. We pray that it's a right now word for each of us. Um, and we just want to pray your blessing on Jennifer as she goes into this week, having given out to us today. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a great day. Back to you, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. And looking at that picture with the Radmers, it does make me feel old because I can remember Rachel being pregnant with uh, Faye and, and, and just, oh, I'm just sorry. His name's gone completely out of my head now, so I am really sorry. That's my, a bit of my nervousness, but I just want to say thank you for that. And um, and it's just great to see the whole family together, especially Little Willow. Um, it's really great to be here. And once again, thank you to everyone who contributed to my presence. I can't wait to get them. It's such a pleasure to be speaking on this particular verse, um, a section of Luke today. And I remember when Ian gave it to me and I looked at it the first time and it talked about forgiveness, I kind of thought, wow, okay. This is a this is an interesting one where Jesus is really telling the Pharisees, telling the Pharisees off. But um, 
But I hope that the messages I bring today, um, the word that I believe God has placed on my heart will bless all of us and really open up our hearts to some really important messages for our time. So this week, as we look at what Jesus and how Jesus taught us to pray, we're looking at forgiveness, mercy and grace through the context of Jesus' encounter with this Pharisee. I've actually called my sermon, Giving That Which Is Within which is actually drawn from what Jesus says um, in the amplified translation of of the verses you just heard read. And in 1141, Jesus calls on the Pharisees, and indeed he's calling on us as well, I believe, to give that which is within us as charity, acts of mercy and compassion, not as a public display, but as an expression of your faithfulness to God. And then indeed all things are made clean for you. And I've called it this because whatever we give, whether it's forgiveness, whether it's mercy, grace, has to come from within. And more importantly, that which is within us. Romans 8, 6 tells us that the mind that is governed by flesh is death, but that governed by the spirit is life and peace. In many ways, this section of Luke is about forgiveness, but it's also about so much more. It's about inclusion. It's about our attitude to the poor. It's about authenticity. And it's about justice. And we learn here how important these things are to Jesus' heart. Now, I'm going to focus on three key messages that Jesus tells us are essential to um, the right relationship with God. But before that, I just want to go back to the beginning. I like this particular section of Luke because I think it shows another side of Jesus that really, really thrills me. Most of the time we see Jesus' compassion, his grace, his love for all. But by the end of this, you actually feel slightly sorry for the Pharisee who invited him to dinner because he got so much more than he bargained for. It didn't end up being the nice showy dinner he'd hoped. And Jesus certainly wasn't the perfect dinner guest for him and his colleagues. And that's really important for all of us. Because you see, when we invite Jesus into our hearts, there's a lot of good stuff that happens. There's the peace that comes with it. There's a joy that comes with it. But make no mistake either about the conviction that happens and the fact that when Jesus comes into our hearts and we truly let him in, he will challenge and he will convict us, not from a place of condemnation because we know there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but because God wants our hearts to be in alignment with him. This part of Luke has some hard hitting messages from Jesus for the Pharisees. But I think they're also hard hitting messages for all of us today. And so I make no apologies for challenging us in the same way that Jesus does the Pharisees. But I said I'd go back to the beginning and Luke 11 starts with a disciple, an unnamed disciple asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. And that's always fascinated me because I wonder often what was he thinking when he asked that request? We're told that just before he asked, he'd watch Jesus praying. And as a young Jewish man, he would have been taught the Torah, he would have been taught the sort of religious words to say to God, he would have even seen the religious leaders praying in the street. And so when I hear this, I don't think it was just words he was seeking, even though as a result of that request, we do get some of the most, probably the most beautiful set of words in the world. But I think what he saw as he watched Jesus was what happened when Jesus prayed the relationship he had with his father, the intimacy of his prayers, the peace that would have surrounded him, the love that would have emanated for him as he communed with his father. And compared to those who stood in the street and bowed a hundred times and went through the ceremonies, I think what the disciple was actually asking was, how is it that you, how, how is it that you've got this relationship with God? How can we have that intimate relationship with him? And when Jesus responds with the Lord's prayer and everything that Luke records in that verse. He's teaching us that being in relationship with his father is all about the heart, the inside, what we have on the inside. And I believe that the Lord's Prayer is a a blueprint for that relationship, that intimacy, and that's what makes it so complete and so powerful 2000 years later. It's a blueprint for a relationship between my heart and my father's heart, your heart and your father's heart, the very heart of God. Now, the Pharisees, in many ways, they were convicted of their own righteousness before God. It took a lot of work and studying to become a Pharisee. You had to really know God's words as they existed in the books of the Torah. You had to have memorized the laws that were laid down through Moses, and there were a good 600 out of them. 
You had to be obedient to all of those laws and show that you were obedient. You had to live this pious life of holiness and righteousness, doing everything right. So technically, in many ways, their whole lives were about serving God. Yet it's clear from what Jesus says that while they might have served him, they did not know him. They did not have his love. And I think that's what this is all about, about our understanding of what it means to have the heart of God inside of us, to have the love of God inside of us. And here's the thing. So when we pray, we speak to the heart of God. So everything that we say, including the Lord's prayer, has to be more than the words. It has to be that real connection. And I think Jesus is, that's why Jesus is so angry with the Pharisees, because they've turned what was meant to be a love relationship into one that is full of duty and showiness and religion and piety, and, and that's not what God wants. But before I talk about this, let me, and exactly what happened in these verses, let me just set a little bit of context. And here's an interesting thing I discovered when I was researching this. Apparently, the Gospel of Luke, or Luke, when he wrote, was the only one who refers to the incidents of Jesus having dinner with people 10 times in his Gospel, which says to me he was either a bit of a foodie and a, maybe a food critic, um, or that he was fascinated by how Jesus interacted with people over food. But going back even further than verse 37, just before the whole dinner thing happens, Jesus is teaching. And um, one of the things that I found really helpful when reading a particular passage in the Bible, and I think I actually learned this from Ian, is that it's always good to go back a few verses before, um, because that often sets the context for the particular things that you're actually reading. So I'm sure students would have mentioned this last week. I'm not going to linger here, but in verse 33, Jesus says something that I think would have really pleased the listening Pharisees. So he talks about putting your lamp on a stand so everyone can see it and not hiding it away. And I think the Pharisees would have misinterpreted that one. Because you see, they, that bit of religion they got, the showy bit, the bit where you put things on show, you put your relationship out there so everybody could see it. And he'd only listened to half of that message because he didn't actually listen to what Jesus said afterwards. Um, and we're told that as Jesus finishes this, you know, and he's been talking about quite a lot of things, as you've heard over the last few weeks. Um, this particular Pharisee can't wait to go up to Jesus and publicly invite him to dine with him. Now, I talk about a thing I call selective scripture, scripture syndrome. It's my own thing. And it's where people pick out selective scriptures that support their own assumptions, biases, presumptions. And that's what this Pharisee does. He likes a bit about putting your light on show, but doesn't quite listen to all of it. So I want you to imagine the scene. You know, we know that Jesus was never alone in the Bible. He always had his own, he had his disciples with him. And actually we're told in verse 29 that the crowds had significantly increased. So this was, you know, this was quite a big group of people that he'd been talking to. So here the Pharisee goes up and publicly invites this, um, you know, this rabbi who is obviously the latest thing in town and invites him to come down with him, dine with him. Now, I don't know if you've been watching The Chosen, which is a really great um, thing on Nine, which looks at, you know, really sets things out in the story of Jesus in the way it would have felt in those days. And, you know, we, this is not a sort of dining room in a three bed house. This would have been sort of like a room with open windows. You know, there weren't proper double glazed windows as we know. And people would have been peering in. So people would have gathered around, you know, seeing Jesus going into this house of the Pharisees. There would have been other Pharisees there. And we're told Jesus goes in and he actually reclines. So he makes himself quite at home. And then it all gets interesting because you see the Pharisees ritually wash their hands before eating. As if, and indeed is laid down in Jewish law. So technically there's nothing bad about that. But this wasn't a kind of 20 second, two happy birthdays, uh, wash your hands that we've all learned to do with COVID. This was a lot of ceremony. You know, you started with the fingertips and then you washed up to the wrist and in between you dried and then you washed again. And so there was all sorts of washing going on. And I imagine, and maybe this is me with an overactive imagination, if all the Pharisees are gathered around, all ceremoniously washing their hands, all kind of looking through the side eyes to make sure everybody's doing it right. And all this time, our Lord is reclining, watching them. He makes no attempt to wash his hands. And then the food arrives. And you actually wonder, what, what would they have been thinking? What, what do they do now? Do they, I mean, they invited him in. Do they share bread with someone who hasn't washed? Someone who's technically unclean? Imagine them thinking our Savior's unclean. Uh, what do they do? 
and we're told that, you know, the, the Pharisee is slightly surprised as a wonderful Fay read that um, he doesn't wash his hands. But what, what do we do? Because you see this story in many ways is about inclusion. Inclusion is defined as the action or state of being included within a group structure. And there are lots of ways that people do this, invite people in, people who are not like them. You know, Jesus wasn't a Pharisee. He wasn't a religious leader. He was a teacher. But they kind of thought, well, you know what, he's probably a bit more acceptable, so we'll just invite him in. But I think in order to be real when it comes to who we bring into our homes, who we invite in to the places that we're at, I think we have to be prepared to examine our hearts for authenticity. You, you, you see, I think Jesus is invited in not so much because they want to feed him, but rather to show how good the host is for having Jesus over for lunch. He doesn't invite the disciples. I mean, he would have known that Jesus was with his disciples. He'd been speaking for quite some time. They would have all been hungry. But he does invite Jesus. And he kind of expects that when Jesus comes in, he will conform to the rules and regulations in that house. And when he doesn't, when he won't, then he can't help but show his surprise and irritation, just as we do sometimes. When we invite people in as in, in, in order to, you know, sometimes do a favor or to make it look good on our part. But then we expect them to behave a certain way. And when they don't, when they don't live up to our expectations, or indeed in some cases live down to our expectations, how gracious are we then? And how grateful and how much do we give of ourselves in those situations? Now, I remember when I first came to the UK and uh, I got this job in the probation service in Colchester and I was so pleased to get it. And, you know, I'd had to change my name to get it, but that's a whole different story because my name, apparently my Nigerian name wasn't Christian enough. Um, but I'd come into, back into the, into the UK with a law degree and yet up to that point, all I could do was find a job washing plates. Um, so this really meant a lot. And I was the only, I discovered as I started working there that I was the only black employee. Um, but that wasn't an issue until one of the senior officers asked me what it felt like to be a token. Now, I actually didn't know what he meant uh, when he said that. And so I asked him to elaborate, which he very kindly did. And he said, what did it feel like to be a token Black person brought in to make the organization look good? I'll never forget how small that made me feel and how devastated I was. You see, when we open our doors to include anyone, be them from a different country, a different race, a different faith, whatever it is, and this applies to all of us, when we don't do it from an authentic place, when we don't do it from the place of our giving, the God that is inside us, then it wounds people. And in everything we do, God looks not at what we do on the outside. And this was a bit the Pharisees didn't get. He looks at what's happening inside our hearts. And authentic giving that is rooted in the unconditional love that Christ has for us is the only real kind of inclusion that works. I believe God is calling us to be authentic in our giving. In the way that we engage with people, we're called to be authentic in those we invite into our homes, in those we give our time to, to keep being authentic even when they don't act the way we expect them to, be the way we want them to, or play by our rules. God loved us when we were yet unclean. He welcomed his, uh, us in. He sat us down to dine, and he made his son the Passover lamb on which we all died so that death would not have us. Can we do the same? In all that we do, we can't be tokenistic, we have to keep it real. And this is a challenge for all of us because it calls us to go further, be more, be more Christ-like. Jesus said, if anyone asks you to go one mile, go two. Can we be those kind of Christians? So let's get back to the story. The Pharisee notices that Jesus hasn't washed and it's all a bit awkward. And then Jesus speaks and he is not the gracious guest. He doesn't hold back. You know, I would say, you know, there's a thing we say in, in my go, he told them. It was a kind of Jesus mic drop moment. He had a lot to say, but in the time we have, I'm going to focus on three specific issues that he says. And the first one comes in verse 40 to 41. And Jesus says, now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup, but in, you clean the outside of the cup, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. 
Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside you, be generous with the poor and everything will be clean for you. Now, when I read this verse, I, you know, it would be easy to think that Jesus was referring to the financially poor. And perhaps he was, you know, outside there would have been a lot of poor people. But as I read this, I, it occurred to me that he was also occurring to referring to the poor in spirit. We're called to acts of compassion and mercy to those who lack. Now, there's many a theological argument that says actually we should all strive for poverty in spirit as that leans towards a total dependence on God. But, and I agree with that, but I'm talking about here those who lack, those whose lives are broken because they don't have enough of God in their lives, those who just can't seem to get it together no matter what is done to support them, the so-called three-wheel tractors. Now, for many, you probably give to a charity or give regularly, but is God calling us to more than that? A few years ago, there was this really interesting emerging school of thought in social sciences about the poor being split into two groups, the deserving and the undeserving poor. And I actually found a definition for this online. And it says that actually that the poor fell into two categories, the deserving and the undeserving poor, depending on whether or not they were regarded as victims of circumstances or whether they were held responsible for their miserable condition. I do wonder to what degree does this feature in our thinking and how generous are we to the undeserving poor? The ones who have had so much help but still keep getting it wrong. The ones dealing with addiction, anger issues, gambling. The ones who just can't get it right. The ones we've helped a lot but still need more. When, when do we stop being generous to the poor? When do we categorize those who deserve our generosity? When do we stop giving them what lies within us? How, how many times do we forgive them? Can we really forgive 70 times seven? After all, there has to be an end, doesn't there? And when does our cutoff point match the cutoff point that exists between us and God? When does he give up on us? Forgive us, Father, even as we forgive those that trespass against us. We're called in this to be as endless in our mercy and grace as he is. Now, get me right, I'm not talking about exposing yourself to constant abuse or letting yourself be taken advantage of. God never asked that of us. But we're called to be generous of heart, generous towards the poor. And as I prepared this, I looked at the meaning of generosity and one dictionary defined it as follows. Showing a readiness to give more of something, especially money, than is strictly necessary or expected. This sums up the heart of God. And I believe we are being called to be generous in this way. It's easy to be generous and merciful, compassionate, forgiving to the people who ask for forgiveness, to the people who deserve our help. But what about the ones who don't? The ones who are not repentant? in the way we'd like them to, the ones who don't ask for forgiveness. Can we love them too, in the way that Jesus is asking us to? Jesus says if we can do that, then it doesn't matter how what we wash on the outside, because that comes from the heart. Yet what kind of heart does it take to do that? What kind of heart does it take to forgive 70 times seven times? What kind of heart does it take to love the unlovable ones, the ones who've hurt us, the ones who seem to make the same mistakes over and over again? the ones who've even hurt us time and time again. I don't think a human heart can do that. I know I can't. I mean, technically, uh, there's a saying that says, you do me once, mistake, second time, my mistake. And that's the theology of the world, that, you know, we shouldn't forgive more than twice. But I know that with a heart that has God within, all things are possible. Because the well from which we draw forgiveness, the well from which we draw mercy, the well from which we draw compassion and grace is the well of Jesus Christ. And it's a well that never, ever runs dry. That's what's within us. I think it takes a heart that knows who it belongs to. And so when Jesus says, our Father who art in heaven, a heart who knows who God is, hallowed and Lord of all. It takes a heart that lives in gratitude because it knows that its daily bread comes from him. 
It takes a heart that knows itself the forgiveness of a gracious and generous God who is slow to anger, compassionate and ever loving. And it's a heart that has God within. And when we give from that place, we don't just give of ourselves, but we give Christ. And we're so connected to the Father that our voice becomes his words, our hands, he's reaching out to the broken and our hearts, the source of true and authentic love that flows straight from the Father and heals the world around us. We go above and beyond. We do the unexpected. I wasn't able to um, attend Judy's um, send off, but I remember when I just came to Restore, short, a few years after I joined and um, I, was, I had a, serious, a pretty major operation and I remember quite unexpectedly, Judy turning up, my, up at my house several times afterwards, just to make sure I was all right, to bring me things. And for me, that was going beyond the expected. I didn't feel particularly known or yet as yet particularly welcome. And she didn't have to do that, but she was generous as we all know Judy to be. And for that, she always held a very special place in my heart. So no wonder Jesus was so angry with these men who claimed to represent God, the father he knew and loved. This father with whom he had this intimate relationship. And these men portrayed him, these Pharisees portrayed him as this harsh, cruel and judgmental God who was totally alienated from his children. Who invited Jesus in for dinner for his show, but were quite happy to leave his disciples outside. He was not going to partake of this ritual cleansing. And we all have to be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. That stuff that isn't genuine, that the attitudes towards others, the words, the beliefs that can so easily creep in and begin to permeate our churches, our relationships, our gatherings, and give rise to the stuff that hurts and breaks people. And even more so now, in the time of social media, when words can be so hurtful, when comments can break people down. Jesus compares the Pharisees to unmarked graves. People walk over without knowing it. And the significance of that is that as a Jewish person, if you went near a dead body or a grave, you realized you'd been made clean. And so you had to cleanse yourself. But you see, the danger of walking over a grave without knowing it was a grave was that you didn't even know that you'd been made unclean. And so Jesus is saying, you, you make people unclean just by coming close to you. And, you know, wash your hands a million times. That doesn't change that. And we have to ask ourselves what happens when people come close to us, our churches, our homes, our communities, our prayer groups. What, what do they take away? What transformation happens? And it's a challenge, not just to the Pharisees. It's a challenge to us today. Because when we begin to focus more on the process of having relationship with God, as opposed to the heart of having relationship with God, then we become as guilty as those Pharisees. One more thing that Jesus says, you tied your herbs and your spices, but you neglect justice. And this is a really interesting one. And herbs and spices that Jesus talks about were part of um, a wider a wider tithing that you were meant to do as a religious leader, and often this would this these tithes, whether they were of your resources or they were of your herbs, the first takings of your herbs and spices, it was part of this duty thing. This supported the synagogue, it supported the priest, it supported the upkeep. And Jesus says, "Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint rue and all other kinds of herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone." That word neglect is a really important one. And I've put the definition on there. You see, when Jesus says this, it will be a reference to the modern day equivalent of our tithing and offering. So this pretty heavy statement he's making, and he's not saying don't do that. He's saying, but you should do both. The Pharisees are doing their religious duty. They support the equivalent of the church, but they neglect justice. Why is this important? because we know that our God is a God of justice. He loves justice. The Bible tells us that over and over again. As Christians, we're called not just to be people who look inwards and do church with each other, but be people who stand up 
for justice. In Isaiah 61, 8, Lord says, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. And let's think about the ways in which people's lives are robbed of peace, are loved of basic necessities, are loved, robbed of a whole number of things. And in Amos 5, 21 to 24, God's words to the Israelites are equally scathing. I hate, he says, and I despise and reject your sacred feasts. And I don't take delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fattened animals. Take the noise of your songs away from me. They're an irritation. I shall not even listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice run down like waters, some say like a river, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, flowing abundantly. If God hates injustice, and as Christians, we neglect it, and that definition is we don't pay it attention or we do not pay it enough attention, pay it no mind. If we are not standing up for the oppressed, the broken, the ill-treated, the marginalized, then we too are as guilty as the Pharisees. Over the last year alone, we have seen injustice across the world. From the death of George Floyd, what's happening with the Mayama, from Sudan to the Uyghurs, wherever you look, from racism to every ism, every form of hatred that there is, there's injustice everywhere. What are you standing up for? What are you paying attention to? How are we, wherever we are, making justice flow like a river? Because if there's one reason every time I read that verse from Amos that I hear loud and clear from the Lord is, whatever you're doing in terms of church and ceremony, if you're not standing up for the broker, if you're not making justice flow like a river, then I'm not really that interested in the rest. So how, how do we have this intimate relationship? Now, post George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, many church leaders, including Ian, our own team, our own preaching team, and others spoke about the injustices of racism and discrimination. And there were many who began to get uncomfortable with that and would have preferred at a point if it didn't get mentioned again. There were many who heaved a sigh of relief in every church and everywhere else when the noise died down, and things came to an end and it stopped being talked about. When they didn't have to see the videos on YouTube over and over again of people being beaten up and ill-treated. You see, for all of us, whether it's racism, whether it's any kind of ism, any kind of discrimination, any kind of oppression, it's so much easier to turn away from injustice, especially when we're dealing with issues of our own. So we don't have to deal with how uncomfortable it is to watch, to hear about, to talk about. The word neglect means to pay no attention to or too little attention to. So now the videos and demonstrations have stopped, the Black Lives Matter movement has been demonized, and we can all go back to not talking about it. But the injustice still happens every day. The people are still getting beaten up. A nine-year-old got pepper sprayed a few weeks ago by police, a nine-year-old black boy in the United States. There are more people in slavery today than there were during the transatlantic slave trade. Domestic abuse, human trafficking, persecution, the way refugees are treated when they flee war-torn countries and come to our own countries, their isolation, the list goes on. We can choose as individuals and as a church to neglect justice, to pay no attention to it. Or we can choose to be the ones who stand up. See, I think the world is changing. COVID-19 has turned things on its head and God is calling his people to stand up and challenge injustice, to speak truth to power in the way that Jesus does across that dining table. As people of God, people who love God, we cannot be silent. We cannot be bystanders. We're called to be more. We have to speak up about the fact that somewhere in the world right now, every minute, a child dies of starvation. I've been speaking for about 20 minutes. The thought that somewhere in the world, 20 children have died in the time it's taking me to speak to you is too devastating to imagine. You don't have to look too far for the injustice around you. 
So why are we neglecting it? Isn't it time for the church to rise up and be the loudest voice against injustice? Because that shows the heart of God when Jesus talks about justice. He says justice and the love of God. Can we be people of God and turn away and get uncomfortable when our brothers and sisters can't breathe because of the weight of injustice on their necks? I'm not sure that as Christians, we're meant to live comfortable lives. We can't get to a point where we're comfortable when other Christians are being persecuted for their faith. I called my sermon, that's giving that which is within. The fact of the matter is that it's been a tough 18 months and we've seen pain and hurt, but even in some of that, some communities have been more affected by others. We could start focusing on our own needs. And I know that so many people have done so many amazing things in their communities through Restore. But we're called to do more, to go beyond the expected. It turns, it's a tough one and it calls for people with hearts filled with the love of God. People who know how to pray, to find time to be intimate with God and rise from that place and teach the word of God to others. It calls for people who will give as they have been given, who will forgive as they've been forgiven who will stand up for the poor, the broken, the suffering, who will not neglect injustice. I want to be one of those people. I realize now that nothing is as important. We cannot be people who just see it. We have to be people who do something about it. We need to refuse to sit down at a table and dine with it. We need to refuse to spend our money in places or with companies that support it. Jesus tells us that doing church is not enough. We have to be bigger than the confines of our church. And we have to show the world the love of God. There's lots more Jesus says to the Pharisees. And by the time he leaves, they're pretty incensed. Truth spoken to power doesn't always land well. You can imagine the scene as he walks out. How dare he? How dare he insult him like that when they invited him in? They allowed him to sit at their table and then he talks to them? But I can imagine also what the people on the outside felt as he walked out, as they would have heard those words, listened in stunned silence as he took on the Pharisees. Jesus had been invited in. He'd been included. You know, he could have chosen to just enjoy his place on the inside, sit down, eat, be like them. At least he was in the room. All those people out the room, hungry. But he chose to use that opportunity to speak up for the injustice. He chose not to wash his hands and dine with them. He chose to speak up for the poor, the broken, those at the wrong side, those who were on the outside of that room. He chose to speak up for the things his father cared about and the reason he came today. And I think he's challenging all of us to do the same, to be authentic in our relationships, not just with people who are like us, who look like us, but everyone. To reach out to the poor and keep reaching out, to forgive and to keep forgiving, to stand up against injustice and not to neglect it. You see, the challenging thing for all of us as we read these words is that if we're not living our lives like this, then we cannot have the kind of relationship with God that Jesus has, that Jesus had. And that relationship is based on so much more than what we say, what we do. And this is a bit the Pharisees never got. It's based on our love for him and our desire to do his will, to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and how we represent him. We're asked to give that which is within us, compassion, mercy, grace, forgiveness, empathy, all that he did. I wanna end with a quote from a Dutch Catholic priest, Henry Nguyen. And he said, compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain, to share in the brokenness, the fear, the confusion, the anguish. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, powerless with the powerless. Compassion means full immersion into the condition of being human. Are you ready? Are we ready as churches to immerse ourselves into the condition of being human? Because I think in the world, as it has been reshaped by COVID, God is looking for us to step up and to step out, to be the voice of justice, to be the voice of compassion, to be the voice of authenticity, to be the voice of love. Are you ready to give that which is within you? Because to give that which is within, you have to fill that place up 
fill it till it overflows with the living water that comes from Christ. And it is out of that well, that overflowing well, not by our own power, not by our own commitment, but by the power that comes from having a relationship with Christ that is built on the heart and built on our understanding of who we are and what we're here to do. Let's pray. Father, we want to be your representatives on earth in everything we do. We want to be people who are authentic in all our relationships, who are generous to the deserving and the undeserving, who forgive as we have been forgiven, who stand up against injustice and shout loudly until justice flows like a river across the world. Forgive us where we too have neglected injustice in our communities, in our place of work, where we haven't stood up. Help us to speak your truth to power when we need to speak on behalf of the oppressed, the discriminated against, the outsiders. Help us to fill ourselves within, with you, so that we can pour out your love, your grace, your compassion to all who need it. Fill us with compassion and grace, Father, till all that we are is all that you have made us to be. In the name of your beautiful Son, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.